Good morning. My name's Emily Butler. I'm the curator of the Conversations program. Thank you so much for being with us on a Saturday morning. We're turning now to look at mushrooms, uh, bacteria and viruses as collaborative agents. And we're delighted to have two artists on stage to discuss how they're working together. I'm delighted that we have with us the artists Jin Liu and Eduardo Katch. Unfortunately, James Bridal is no longer able to be with us today. The panel is moderated by my esteemed colleague, uh, Jenny Fulton, our head of editorial at Art Basel. <coughs> There'll be some time for questions at the end of the panel, but first of all, please do join me in giving our speakers a very warm round of applause and enjoy the conversation. <clears throat> thank you, Emily, and a warm welcome also from my side. Um, thank you for joining us at 11 o'clock this morning. And um, I'm very excited to have on stage with me Jin Lu and Eduardo Catch. Uh, and and uh, I wanted to say thank you here to my colleagues at Art Basel. I want to say thank you to Emily, uh, Kali Milliar, and Jess Davis Molloy. And without further ado, let's jump in. So, unfortunately, James Bridal, who's the author of this book, Ways of Being, which examines the relationships between sort of human and non human intelligence, couldn't be with us today. But I still wanted to introduce the panel by giving a brief summary of some of the key concepts in the book. I think at this moment in time, and particularly where we are here in Miami, we're increasingly aware of the fragility of planetary ecosystems and life on Earth. It feels like a good moment to think about refocusing, not putting the human at the center of it anymore, but looking at different ways how artists, scientists, <coughs> and cultural agents can act together to understand the, the, the species that we share the planet with in a better way. Thinking about non-human forms of intelligence, consciousness, and knowledge. James Bridal's Ways of Being is an exploration of different kinds of intelligence, of plant, animal, human, and artificial, and how they transform our understanding of humans' place in the cosmos. What does it mean to be intelligent? Is it something unique to humans, or is it shared with other beings? Beings of flesh, wood, stone, and silicone. The last few years have seen rapid advances in artificial intelligence, but the, rather than a friend or companion, AI increasingly appears to be something stranger than we ever imagined, an alien invention that threatens to decenter de and supplant us. And actually, it's very timely because just, today, just yesterday, I think, the European Union passed a law limiting the applications of artificial intelligence. So it feels like a very timely moment to be having this conversation about the potentials as well. At the same time, we're only just becoming aware of the other intelligences that have been with us all along, even if we failed to recognize or acknowledge them. These others, the animals, the plants, the natural systems that surround us are slowly revealing their complexity, agency, and knowledge, just as the technologies we've built to sustain ourselves are threatening to cause the ex their extinction and ours. What can we learn from them? And how can we change ourselves, our technologies, our societies, and our politics, I think most importantly, to live better and more equitably with one another and the non-human world? I'm so... I think we're going to jump straight in. I mean, Eduardo has had a really long career. He was born in 1962, and he's internationally recognized for his groundbreaking work in contemporary art and poetry. In the early 1980s, so this is before the, uh, obviously before the, um, in the launch of the internet, he created digital, holographic, and online works the, that anticipated the global culture we live in today, composed of ever-changing information in constant flux. His Singular and highly influential career spans poetry, performance, drawing, printmaking, photography, artist books, early digital and online works, holography, telepresence, we're going to dive into all of these, bio art and space art. And I think most excitingly, James, you're, uh, James, Eduardo, you're going to launch one of your artworks into space on Christmas Eve. And we're going to go into that slightly later in the panel. Jin Lewin is an artist and engineer. She's the arts curator at the Space Exploration Initiative at MIT Media Lab, an artist in residence at SETI Institute. Now, if you don't know what SETI is, it's the Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence. It's a very fascinating combination here. Recent institutional solo exhibitions include Seedlings and Offsprings at Pioneer Works in New York and At the End of Everything at Art Space in San Antonio. She's an advisor for the LACMA Art and Technology Lab and a researcher on the Antikythera program at the Bergman Institute, Los Angeles. That's the machine, isn't it? The Greek machine, the Antikythera mechanism. Yeah, if you watch the Indiana Jones, you'll see. 
Her work has been shown in many places, including the Shanghai Biennale, the Thailand Biennale, M Plus Museum in Hong Kong, the Used Museum in Shanghai, MoMA PS1 in New York, Maxi Rome, the Sundance Film Festival, Ars Electronica, and uh, Onassis Foundation in New York, amongst many others. And I think one of the things that we were talking about earlier today when we were having breakfast together was really these unusual trajectories. I mean, neither of you sort of went to art school in a classical sense. You came to the art world via different angles. So beginning with you, Jin, you originally studied engineering. What yeah. drove your pathway into becoming an artist? My undergrad uh, was called Precision Instruments, um, Mechanic Engineering. And, and after my college, I was just uh, intrigued by the idea, or like troubled by the idea that the education system nowadays, or at least when I was a student, was dividing science and engineering and liberal arts in a sense it's like we are making you into two kinds of people. And after my college years, I felt like I was made into one kind, but I was envious of the other side. So I decided to take my gap years uh, in art school for grad student, uh, like as my, um, you know, the, the last leisure time that I'll ever have before I jump back into Google. Um, I love that your leisure time was studying art. <laughs> yeah, I, I just felt like it's the most exciting possibility and it's so uh, mysterious to me. So um, I went to Rhode Island School of Design and I did fine arts that for two years. Mm -hmm. Yeah, in, in RISD. Um, and I have to say, it's just too, too good to leave and I, I got addicted. I realized is the most freeing experience I've ever had. So I continued um, at my education in MIT Media Lab, where I was hoping that it can synthesize all these backgrounds together, which it did. So I ended up being an artist uh, at this point. But I still do lots of engineering, engineering work, and I think that's something we're going to talk about today. Yes, because uh, you mentioned earlier also that you're about to publish a, pa uh, a, a paper in Nature magazine. Yeah, and we're working on it. You're working yeah. on it. And it's very exciting. I think you're the first artist I've ever met who is publishing at, in peer-reviewed scientific journals at that level. And first author. <laughs> and first, ooh. Moving on to you, Eduardo. Now, you started making art at a very early age. You told me you were 17 years old when you first started to think about being an artist. And this was in late, very late 70s, early 1980s Brazil which you told us was a very different moment in time than our, in our very globalized world today. Can you go a little bit into kind of what drove your career, what the red threads are there? Well, I, I started in 1980, and I was 17. And I thought that, you know, I looked at art schools and art departments at universities, and I felt that the environment was very conservative, and I realized that I would be bored to death and I'd be fighting professors. That would not be a productive use of my time. So college presented this conundrum, you know, how can I do something here that will feed my practice? What, what's the best choice that will stimulate me and help me move forward with my practice? And I chose communications because communications was a very interdisciplinary environment where I could study anthropology, sociology, linguistics, semiotics, languages, philosophy comics, and there was no prejudice of any kind. And I felt that was, retrospectively, uh, that was the right choice. It was very stimulating. But uh, I started with performances and poetry and graffiti and all kinds of mixed media. But by 1982, I, I realized that really what I wanted to do looking forward, moving forward, was in the realm of technology. So I created my first work, my first digital work in 82, my first holographic work in 83, first work online in 85, first telepresence work in 86, and onwards. And then in the 90s, you coined the concept of bioart, which I quote, works with genetic methods to transplant synthetic genes into one organism or natural genetic material from one species into another, and thus to create a unique living being. What prompted you to do this? I mean, I think in a second, we're actually going to see one of the works that Eduardo is possibly best known for, which is his GFP bunny. Yeah, if we encounter this body of work out of the blue... Here we are. Right. That's from 2000. as uh, a real, living, breathing, green, glowing rabbit. But if we encounter this work out of the blue, it seems perhaps out of context. But in reality, if you look at my trajectory, which spans over 40 years, you see that I started investigating a key aspect of human communication, which is language, 
and in a sense dissolving it, disassembling it, creating immaterial, mutable, transformable experiences with language in holography, online. And that led me to works with telecommunications at the distance using radio, television, fax machines, Minitel, etc. And that led me to the question of online. I'm talking about 1985 when I say online, right? Online in 1985, which is not different from today. We, we reduce the experience of communication to a screen. And we know the value of being together in a room, having breakfast with a friend, being at a party. You communicate through multiple channels simultaneously. Look at me right now. I'm smiling. I'm moving my hands. So you, you use, sim I'm speaking, right, multiple channels simultaneously. You can touch somebody when you hug somebody. You communicate through touch. All of this is absent from screen. So I started to develop the idea of telepresence art. How can I break through the screen and exert physical presence at the remote location? So this amounts to creating telerobotic bodies. So for example, we're in Miami. Imagine that we're here and the telerobotic body is in Tokyo. You, from Miami, you're physically here. You find yourself in the body of that robot in Tokyo. You're looking through its eye, but you don't know what the body looks like unless there is a mirror in the room and you discover that mirror. But in my experience, when I put a mirror in the room, people hit it because they think it's a gateway. And then they bounce back and they realize, oh, that is my body. And then you rediscover it and you begin to look at that space. And some of these robots, and I think this gets closer to what you want to really talk about, these robots are not anthropomorphic. The ones I created, they have different body configurations. So you're closer to the perspective of a non-human, you see? And you see the world from the perspective of the other, which of course has clear symbolic and metaphoric implications, mm -hmm. putting yourself in the perspective of the other. That brought me to bioart, because rather than putting humans in the body of the other, I was directly creating the other, you see? Mm -hmm. I think that's really interesting. I mean, Jin, were you aware of Eduardo's works when you were studying? Were you oh, absolutely. I'm like fangirling right now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I think uh, when I was studying um, in RISD, it was quite an exciting moment that um, finally I think um, digital art, media art, and the conversation between art, design, technology, and sciences are becoming very potent. So it, it's really interesting because I came from engineering background and in the art school I was at, everyone was trying to learn like things, bleeping lights, like something called Arduino. They're, they're trying to make a little robots moving around. I'm like, oh, but I'm here to learn the other way. So I went to glass departments and I went to learn like wood making. I wanted to do jewelry while all my classmates were trying to code on their computer. And it was just really wonderful conversations and we're, we were able to help each other. And of course, like I was very much aware of all the pioneers and looking at post-internet art, bio art. And I think it really uh, gave me that confidence this is possible. Something I was dreamed of is um, manifested already like in the world. It just lead me into like a further development of that. And uh, that's why I end up in uh, MIT and further the study. I think without all, all the work Eduardo has been put out there, like there won't be my generation of artists at all. I mean, I think one thing that's really interesting is that we are, I mean, the 1990s was such a moment for um, DNA, ideas of DNA sequencing. It's when we first fully sequenced the human genome. It's when we had the first cloned animal that came into being, namely Dolly the sheep. And I very vividly remember this as a 15-year-old schoolgirl. Um, and so that, this, it seems that there was a parallel there between kind of your practice, Eduardo, and what you were doing when you were taking these different types of DNA. Also with the flower that you can see earlier, you actually took your own DNA and inserted it into a petunia, which is now called a junior. Bob, maybe I'll switch the, to the other presentation so I can just show the audience where, what a junior looks like. Up, go backwards, duck, duck, duck. So maybe you want to talk a little bit about a junior and, um, yeah, here we are, this is a junior. So yeah, my, my goal here was to move a fragment of my DNA 
from my red veins to the red veins of the flower to create what I call a plantimal. So it's not just a physical act of communication from my body to the flower's body, but it's also the goal was for the flower to produce a human protein, my human protein in its body. Flowers do not make human protein in the wild. This one does. So what does this mean for a member of another species to accept my DNA and in its body for it to do the same thing that it does in mine? When we eat a tomato for lunch, we don't think that there is much contiguity between us. We're here, the tomato's over there. But think about it in another way. If you take a motor from, say, a helicopter, and you try to put it in your car to run your car, is that going to run? No, because they're just not designed in a compatible manner. But if I can take a piece of DNA from my body, insert it in a flower, and it does in the body of the flower the same thing that it does in my body, that speaks for itself. We are much closer than we would like to believe. So this is, in my view, a symbolic statement about the continuity of life among species. Think about it. Evolution on Earth started 3.8 billion years ago. The Earth itself started 5 billion years ago, right? So evolution, 3.8 billion years ago. That's a long time. 65 million years ago, the dinosaurs went extinct. No humans to speak of. 65 million years ago, no humans to speak of. Humans appear more or less 300,000 years ago, right? Homo sapiens. So when you think about the history of evolution, we separated from that common stuff of life a long time ago. Flowers went one way, we went another way. But if our stuff works in the flower, that means that we're really that close. And this, in a sense, is a blooming symbol of how close we are to the community of life. Likewise, uh, Jin, you also had, I'm just going to, it was a flower-based project called Lycoresis, which was inspired by the German biologist Ernst Haeckel's illustrations on biological evolution. And Ernst Haeckel is quite a key figure for this type, the type of art that we're talking about for our discussion here, but also for James Bridle's work, where he really uh, he coined the term ecology in 1866, and he was really looking at species classification, how the species evolved. And I was wondering if you could talk us through the project Lycoresis. Do you have images for this as well? Yeah, it's so sad I didn't put it there, but they are essentially um, procedurally uh, generated flower shapes that is very inspired by a microorganism. And it's really interesting now you're putting up this image. So there's something I'm always trying to find is that we have fascination around technology and science, but there's also a tyranny of technology and science in this modern society. So for me, I was trying to find a place that there is this really connected um, maneuver of advanced technology that we can use it, we can play with it, but also is humble warm warmth of humanity that is also actually able to hug over it and be able to make it become part of us. So similarly, like the lacrosis, it's generative, it's all um, done by code. You're looking at mathematical formations, which is exactly um, similarly like how nature naturally would connect with each, with each other, like almost unconsciously, but now we have dots around that. Um, forming this biodiversity is like beyond imagination. So I was very interested in how whether I can replicate something at that level with just pure code. But in the meantime, this work particularly, they are uh, actually uh, my entire genome data that I sequenced back in 2019 and... Which is um, in this project, right? Yeah, so in order to kind of have this connection with it, maybe similar like how you felt, that I was just um, maybe a little bit like uh, boring in, in a sense that I was like, I, I don't, 
felt feel anything if looking them in this TV screen. I want to have a tangible connection with literally me. So I decided to print them out, which you know people have done that previously. There are amazing projects like from the science community. People made books of the entire genome, and if, for the smallest font that I, with my bare eye, can see, that I printed my genome data, just the X chromosome, which was a thousand-page book, and I made this accordion uh, format, that is you know both paying. Um, Respect to my Asian history, but uh, heritage, but also that's the only way that I can make a book that is a thousand pages、uh, by hand. So I printed on Japanese rice paper, and I was just folding, gluing, folding, gluing, and it was really fascinating because it's very labor intensive, and it become almost this performance and dance, and it just like. Sunk in myself <laughs> physically, and then later in the、uh, in, in the other image, I start getting pages of those.、Uh, so these ones here, yeah, of the book that I start sew on them and responding to the pages where、um, the 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 forms come throughly、uh, come through, and I start giving them names and stories that is related to my personal experience. I think I was trying to use myself as if I'm a generative. System. I'm like trying to force myself to have responses, and I chose sewing as the the method instead of drawing. Is because drawing is too easy. I can just make a shape, and、yep. it comes from my conscious mind. But sewing is so hideous that I have to like kind of make decisions, and I like my eyes so narrow is like as small each point that I'm poking is as small as the the actual code itself. So then it become a little bit lucid. I am always very interested in how I can connect with information that is scientific, that is technology,、uh, but from a sensory, almost like emotional space. So, so really, making that link between what it is to be a human, what it is to be a sentient, breathing individual, and then、uh, translate this,、uh, translating from kind of the more abstract scientific world into something that's reproducible. Now, I think Eduardo, one of your、um, works in Genesis. You actually invented a gene, and you invented a gene based on the sentence: "Let man have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the fowl of the air, and over every living thing that moves upon the earth," which you then encoded into a bacterium that started to evolve. Can you speak about that project? Sure. Perhaps we can、uh, pull up the image.、Uh, it's actually an interactive work.、Um, I started developing. There you go.、Uh, I started to develop that in '98 and presented it in '99. Uh, in in Austria for the first time, and you see here perspective from you know seeing one wall, but on the right wall you have the biblical sentence. Behind us you would have the Morse code that I used to translate, and here you have the DNA. So to recap, starting with the biblical statement from the book of Genesis, using Morse code to translate the English statement into Morse dots and dashes. And I created a code that allowed me to go from two elements, dots and dashes, to the four bases that we usually use to describe DNA, A C G T. With that, I synthesized the actual sequence, which now encoded the biblical statement. You see, using Morse to encode DNA, and then actually synthesizing it. With that, with that DNA sequence, I then attached another sequence that allowed. The organism to glow green, because it's a way for you to visualize and confirm that the organism has accepted your sequence. Right. So you so, can see those on. Yep. Right. So in the installation, you have the bac- petri dish with the bacteria in the center, on top of a UV light box, that is projected on the wall. Bacteria very small, projection very large. Micro, macro. Right. There is UV light in the room. So the letters are glowing. Humans are glowing. So there's a sense of empathy because you look at the letters; they're glowing. You look at your fellow visitors; they're glowing. You go into the center; the bacteria are glowing. So you begin to see that everything is connected. Right? You see, there's a computer here on the first plane, but you could do this from home as well because this is online. What is online? Your ability to turn on. The UV light or the white light, 
white light stimulates growth, UV light causes mutation. In other words, you're sitting comfortably in Miami, the work is exhibited, let's say, in Paris. You, in your pajamas, are changing the word of God in the bacteria <laughs> in Paris 24-7. The show is open 24-7, right? The museum closes, but it's online. It's physical there. You can go and see it. You can interact with the computer in the room. It's physical, but you can also do it from home or on your phone. This was in 1999. 99, right. And uh, then I brought the bacteria back to the lab to see the mutation. And I created works on granite, their prints. There's a whole body of work uh, that evolves from that. But essentially, think about it, what I just said. Information went into a living organism, right? A biblical statement went into a living organism, like us, a living organism. Non-biological information went into a living organism. It got transformed, and it was then retrieved in a living organism. What, what have I described? Input, processing, output. Like a computer. Exactly like a computer, and like a phone. When you do anything on the phone, you are inputting, and then you're seeing something. Like you go online. You want to see something in New York Times, whatever. You click, input. You get the information, output. Right? You send an email. You're processing information. But you're doing that in a living organism. So in a very practical way, not as a metaphor, as a projection, a speculation, a very material way, you realize that the boundaries between the living and non-living effectively dissolve. Mm. I mean, I think one of the interesting... Uh things that James describes in his book is really this idea of the non-human internet. And he uses the example of uh, trees commu communicating via fungi, for example. You know, So if you change the environment of a tree, and for instance, there's a, a poisonous substance, the tree can actually react, or a predator, say a, a moth or an aphid that will eat the tree. The tree can transform its genetic expression to make its leaves less tasty for this particular moth. And it will share this information via this mycelium network. And again, also with slime molds, which is another example that James refers to. So basically what he describes this experiment where they put colonies of slime molds on the different epicenters of Tokyo. You know, so you've got the different suburbs of Tokyo, you've got the middle, and then the slime molds started going towards each other in such a way that they mimicked, and Tokyo's got one of the world's most efficient public transport networks. It's a metropolis of 20 million people. And what these slime molds did was that they took the most efficient routes between these different forms of colonies. And so there, again, you had this idea of this non-human centric, non-designed, but nevertheless extremely efficient communicative network. So I think that speaks to that, to what you were doing with Genesis as well. Um, Jin, earlier we were speaking about cryo, which is a new series of works. It's mixed media sculptures. I'm actually going to jump forward to them. Um, inspired by biological and medical innovations, such as egg freezing, for example. I mean, very common process these days. Um, and you were talking about how this made you think about immortality and concepts of immortality. Can you talk about cry uh, cryo? Yeah, so um, lots of my practice actually um, are deeply around this concept of uh, metabolism, both in a personal way and in a cosmic way. My research in MIT was the sense of self, and I was looking at that from a cognitive um, science, but also how technology and systems could manipula manipulate that sense of self, because we're constantly moving and shaping ourselves, you know, from a baby till now. Like, how did we sustain this sense of self through decades? And then for this work, is kind of centered around the question of metabolism, but in a much larger context. So cryogenics is a very commonly used technology uh, in science fiction. If you want your hero protagonist to live forever and saving the universe, you need to keep them alive by freezing and melting them at pivotal, pivotal moments of the history. And it's, it's fascinating as a device for storytelling. But if you really think about it, what does it mean? It's saying that time is not even worth living if it's not important. And I think for me, it's 
kind of intriguing, but also problematic in many ways. And I always work with technology uh, only if I have you know, actual access to it and I can manipulate and I can feel or I can insert myself into it. So I always just look afar because I don't think I'm going to freeze my brain for a while. Um, <laughs> but yet um, I'm in my 30s and now uh, in the past two years, the, the lingering ghost of my life is that whether and when I'm going to have a baby or not. And egg freezing became part of the story. And I start talking with lots of people around the technology. And my mom is an OB doctor. And then that's when I realized it's fundamentally the same technology and fundamentally the same question around productivity, production, and reproduction. And in the sense that our world is so much, the capital itself is based on human labor, and the story of human species and space exploration is also much centered around the idea is that how do we preserve, how do we start it off, how do we slow it down, and time in that story is just relative. The most divine material or existence is like up to us to decide whether a flow or not. So, so that's basically you're taking away one of the fundamental human fears, which is fear of dying. Yeah, so that's where I was like really start looking at this whole um, phenomenon and doing research in both, you know, welcome collection in the UK, looking at the whole history of like uh, female reproduction and technology of all that manipulation, but also looking at seat vaults around the world, such as the Kew Garden in London and, and the, 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 weld, uh, the vault in Salbart. Because we now have this seat vaults all around the world in like the coldest, coldest places to s save um, different kind of seeds of plants because we're so scared of plan uh, planet and climate catastrophe. So if some species died, we can revive them by replanting them all around. But at the same time, it's this weird dilemma, I think, between the future and the manipulation of the future, but also kind of for forgetting about now, I mm. think. So for this work, uh, you see very closely that white part of the mouse, it's my mouse, is actually casted in bronze. Um, but I used my customized cooling system to cool down the bronze so much, the surface temperature is minus four. So it's a layer of frost you're seeing here that is being actively generated through the exhibition. Fascinating. I mean, I think one, tw uh, one thing that stuck in my mind when I was doing research for this panel is that back in September, you tweeted that technology is a feeling. Can you go into that? Yeah, I, I, th I feel like there has been so much changes in our ways, uh, uh, the human relationship with the technology, right? When, when things happen from the beginning, where like there is this euphoria around what's even possible. And also the moment that you realize it's not everyone who would have access to um, technologies that can manipulate everyone's life and time and spaces. But then there's also now, I think, there is this really um, strange tension between technology and humanity in many ways. You see debates around the world, just, just like you just said, uh, around AI is like this, the otherness that I think for me is what really at stake for artists. Because um, if deep down we are people who are, at least for me I think, uh, artists are people who are sensitive, sensitive to the world, to the contemporary moment. And I believe artists are also people who are often deep down very tender. And even though we are looking at our technology and sciences, but we have the ability to enter and create spaces for conversations and be able to expose ourselves, like you're st like you literally in injecting your DNA into a flower, like me printing all my genetic genetic data into a book and presenting it to the audience. We're trying to create this create this emotional and sensorial connections for the audience. I think it's like you said, is a, is a political moment because we don't want a world that it end up being that technology. Is, um, it is tyranny, it, it's scary for humanity. We want a place that people felt like we can live with it 
I want technology to be part of culture, to be part of nature even in some sense. Yeah, effect on nature. Eduardo, do you want to comment on that? Uh, I think it's a, it's a curious irony that we have the tendency to use the word technology for things that are not familiar. Think about it. Uh, you use your car. You don't think, oh, I'm going to use this complex technological device that has more computers than I have in my own home. You just say, oh, I need to go to the supermarket. I need to visit a friend. You just use it, and it becomes an extension of your body and your daily routine. Your phone, extremely complex. You compare the early computers that are as big as this room to the power of the telephone, and you don't think, oh, I'm going to use this very complex, sophisticated, uh, very fast piece of technology. You just think, I'm going to call my friend, right? But then when you talk about rockets, you say, oh, technology. You talk about something very complex, nuclear fusion, you say technology. Things that are not accessible or very complex that escape comprehension, you reserve the word technology for that. But in reality, it's all part of the same continuum. I think that's really interesting. I mean, I also want to talk about um, how your backgrounds in tech, like what do, what do your backgrounds in tech tell you about the relationship between machine intelligence and biointelligence and, and vice versa? And you are currently going to embark on a project uh, that's AI focused for Rhizome 7 on 7, aren't you? So Yeah, yeah. Right after this talk, I'm flying to Boston um, for, for a collaboration. So this work is really interesting. I'm, I'm working with... Um, a company in in biotech. They are a leading um, kind of leading voice in a sense, and using um, mi microbe and um, microorganisms to produce chemicals such as frequencies, such as medicines. So it's really interesting nowadays. We are looking at uh, biology as this uh, little machines that we can. Um, direct and use technologies such as CRISPR to really um, take advantage of that regenerative and rather cheaper um, maintenance capacity. Um, so for this work, for AI, what we are interested in particularly is that normally in biology and AI, what people do if you don't uh, you're not familiar with this, that um, traditionally if we want to use something in biology, we have to do a lot of trial and error and trying to think about, okay, this uh, bacteria can create a very unique, um, let's say, antibody. And can I take that gene or can I find some part of it and to glue with another bacteria, another protein capaci capacity, so this, antipo this antibody can have a carrier, like a vehicle, and enter your body better. And normally, these two part of the functions are in very far places in the natural world, and we're using synthetic biology to kind of combine them together. And in AI, what's very interesting is that we have this large base data system uh, that we can understand all the little bits and parts of biology that it can do, and we can synthesize those information and trying to find solutions that human biologists are not necessarily able to, not because they can't, just because they might not be able to remember millions of functionalities in bacteria in the natural world. But for me, what I found interesting is, is kind of the hallucination of it. Because you, if you saw like, you know, uh, make journey with Dao E, sometimes it's not that interesting to my taste when AI generate the perfect picture just like a human would have done, like five fingers. When it has four fingers, six fingers, I find it interesting because there's this slippy slope and uh, places that things could have happened, very likely, but it didn't. And biology is very much about it because nature is all random. So it's not necessarily that nature had an idea of like this is the right way to do things. It's through random randomness and error and evolution that we have this flourishing biodiversity. So in this work with um, uh, 7 on 7, what we are really looking at is how AI would be able to hallucinate and combine with um, synthetic biology. Maybe we'll create something that is might happen in the real life, but not yet or will be. I mean, I think we were talking about the albino alligator that was found in the swamps yeah. of Florida. I think it was yesterday. There's a big Guardian article about it. And you were very um, eloquent about it. So, so I think I wonder if you could um, 
we could re recast that conversation this morning at breakfast. Oh, right. Yeah. Between a, a double espresso and some fruit, <laughs> we were talking about the, uh, the albino alligator. And, um, you know, albino animals uh, have traditionally been the object of uh, sacred attention. Uh, native populations have gone out of their way to celebrate and preserve albino creatures. And even though that in those different contexts, uh, that, that act acquired uh, sometimes religious or, or mystical qualities, behind it there is also the recognition of the uniqueness of that life. Because albino creatures are mutations, and it's a mutation that creates a fragility for the being that has that characteristic in the sense that they become easier prey and very easily would disappear. Those traits would easily disappear. So by having this aura around it and preserving it, it's a way for different uh, tribes and different cultures to contribute to the preservation of the diversity of life. It's the case of the albino rabbit, for example. The albino rabbit would have easily disappeared because it's easier prey. But uh, due to human participation in its evolution, we have populations of albino rabbits. That's fascinating. I think for the last uh, 10 minutes or so of the panel, I'm going to change gears a little bit and go into orbit. So. Um, both Zhu and Eduardo, both of you are uh, have launched artworks into space or are about to launch an artwork into space. So, Eduardo, given that yours is the one that's coming up, I wonder if we could talk a little bit about Agora, which is what we see here. Agora. Right. So, um, th uh, this is very emotional because I've been working on this project for 37 years. And it launches on December 24th at 1.49 a.m. Yes, I know the exact minute because this is very precise and I'm counting the seconds. What, what we're seeing here is uh, I'm holding a hologram with the left hand and with the right hand I am turning on a laser that shines on the hologram and in this case it's projecting on the wall. I have to have a wall to be able to produce a picture. But in reality, imagine that that wall is like a foot further away or two or three. What happens is that from the hologram, this information is propagating in space and time. So if the wall was a foot behind, the image would be bigger and bigger and bigger. There is no focus because this is not like a lens that you're using a projector to project on the wall is information traveling in space and time. There is no scale, there is no focus. It's propagating light in space and time like a star. So this is why I think of this work as a potential star because it was conceived for deep space. And when once retrieved in the future and looked at again, it will continue to propagate. So let's backtrack a little bit and make sense of this because I realize it can get abstract very quickly. All right, so <clears throat> uh, the rocket, by yeah, the, the, the rocket is actually right now in Cape Canaveral on the platform for testing. And um, it's a United Launch Alliance rocket, as you can see. This picture does not show the top where the work will be located because they're testing the, the booster. But the work itself is this information encoded in a hologram. Can you maybe explain what Agora means? I will do that yeah. right now. Uh, the title of the work is Agora, with the accent on the first syllable. And that is because the work is from 1986. I was addressing primarily a Lusophone audience at the time, right? I was living in Rio. I was addressing primarily Portuguese-speaking audiences. So the work was created in Portuguese. Agora is the same as in English, Agora. So it refers to a public space. But what you see projected, so in Portuguese it has an accent above the first A. Right? What you see projected is the same letters but without the accent. That is pronounced agora, which means now. So you see one makes reference to space, the other makes reference to time. 
And the difference is a very small element, the accent mark, which functions like this hinge that articulates space and time in the work. The work is flying in a very small capsule made of titanium, which is inside the cone of the rocket. The rocket will fly to deep space and will be in a permanent heliocentric orbit until the end of time. It's a elliptical orbit that will take it between the Earth and Mars and between Earth and Venus forever. So your forever. artwork will last potentially forever. So, and that launches December 24th. It's going to be live in the ULA uh, YouTube website. Jin, you have already sent arts into space. Yeah. <laughs> Can you talk about uh, your wisdom tooth? Yes. That made it back to Earth, I believe. Yeah, that's the first um, uh, work I've sent to space. I actually launched right um, in Van Horn, Texas. And that's the payload you saw um, back when it's like back on Earth already. And on the top of it, there is my wisdom tooth. Um, the whole device is, is a vehicle and then I made a box for its stage. So if you go to the slide before, you can see that's a moment one is floating um, in, in zero gravity as it was like um, passing through the sky. The, the thing I was very interested in is, again, metabolism and in many different ways. The wisdom tooth, lots of people ask me <coughs> why. So, so in Chinese, like a kind of tradition, um, there's a saying that if, as a kid, if you lose a teeth, uh, for top tooth, you bury it under um, the ground in the earth, and bottom teeth, you throw it up high to the ceiling. And that was a bottom wisdom tooth of mine. And in the whole story of that journey, I filmed uh, and lots of that is about this transcendent experience. Why do you set something up to the sky? Is, uh, is a wish for the children to grow taller and healthier. And for me, this idea that human wants to leave our cradle and go to places is a transcendent experience. And in many ways, I do believe Earth is the best place um, in the entire universe. And as an Earth-bound species, there is something really important with the land that for me, as someone who moved from Northwest Xinjiang in China to Beijing, to New York, to London, I still felt like this unresistible warmth. And I almost teared up once when I hear my local dialect randomly in London once. So there's something very important to know that where we come from is important, but also that journey is where, when you realize that. So that's why I was very interested in that transcendent experience. Like, Why do we want to go with all those conversations around colonialism and expan expansionism and technology being accelerationism? What is our own position in that changes? Are we destined destined to choose between conservative, living in a little hermit style, never leave your home, or you can just go away and never worry about the disruptions that you caused along the way? I think there's something in between that that is um, more circular, is more about this metabolism that is going there and coming back and grow not as like a linear straight line but coming back and again and again so that's really a, what I was thinking a lot when I'm doing works around technology and space art is about the journey and not the destination and the end of it. Thank you. Um, one more question before we open it up to audience questions and I think this is really interesting because obviously these are all very complex projects that took a long time to, in your case, 37 years to bring to life. And as you were saying in your earlier example of seeing your fellow students at RISD learning how to code while you wanted to learn how to sew, it's a complex and sometimes I think quite tricky situation for artists to navigate because they're not natural technologists, shall we say. And then I wanted to ask you both, how should artists engage with te technologies? Why don't you start, Eduardo? Well, I would say that painters are not chemists, and yet they 
manipulate, paint, and produce marvelous images. For an artist whose medium is technology, is like paint, and this is what we do. Because it's a ex natural extension of our practice. Of course, you can develop it at the level of engineering or a PhD in physics. That's a different path. But uh, you can work with it in a more intuitive, uh, playful way. Uh, your exploration of technology is a natural extension of your research and your practice as an artist. Thank you. Yeah, I think there's two parts. The first bit is the knowledge, like because for different disciplines, there's a knowledge system that is sometimes difficult to get a grasp on immediately. But now we're living in the mercy of internet. I really think, wow, you don't like people can learn anything if they put their minds to uh, on the internet. But the more important or more challenging aspect of it is access, um, and is very very obvious that artists living in the United States, living in Europe, would have a lot more access to technologies and corporations than, than artists from the global south. Uh, so one of the projects maybe we can mention here is that um, when I, after the living distance work, I got uh, offered to launch another work to International Space Station for 30 days. Of course, I was thrilled, but I also felt like damn, that's going to be some bad karma if you just do that second time just all for myself. So uh, instead, I decided to make this um, kind of um, space station, very tiny one, for, like, you know, it's the entire sculpture is this big. And inside of it is a telescoping structure. On each layer, there are six pockets. The top one is staying still for microgravity. The bottom two are spinning at a different speed to mimic artificial gravities of a lunar and Martian. Uh, gravity, and uh, I made an open call, um, international open call to the world to like, whatever you want, if it's safe and uh, it's small enough, uh, I can help you launch it. Because I know lots of artists have amazing ideas, they just don't have the kind of access and the ways to navigate the system. You know, there's lots of paperwork and etc. And I've done that once. And I'm happy to do it a second time. And uh, so in this work with um, 18 pockets, we got nine group of, uh, groups of artists from like seven different countries. Um, and many of them have never um, launched anything remotely close to that altitude. And um, it was launched in March 2020, right before the pandemic. And it became this connection. And it was very like touching because um, we start emailing each other as the, inter uh, the International Space Station was orbiting the Earth and we are isolated at home and it passes, people take pictures, like, oh, it's passing through me now because we are actually global. And three of the artists from this open call de um, detour their entire career nowadays. They are very much focused on space art. And with this project, they were able to get more grants and more funding for their more ambitious projects. I think that's just how it started. You know, Thank like you. It, it's, it's never too little, but uh, there's lots of collaboration and sharing. Thank you, that's a lovely note. Now, are there any questions from the audience? Oh gosh, that's a lot. <laughs> <laughs> there are roving microphones, but please do keep it short because we're sort of running out of time, unfortunately. Gentlemen, the front, yeah. Eduardo, it's a pleasure to meet you. Um, I'm a biologist, and you've influenced my my life. Like, uh, and I just I hope we get to chat at some time. I actually did email you when I was a PhD student. I didn't hear back from you, but it's okay. I wasn't <laughs> ready yet. Um, okay, so I have a quick question about your uh, your 2003 2008 transgenic work there. So I was a graduate student when that was when it was still out, and I like you're part of the traje trajectory that I ended up there, but. Um, what it really has always been for me was was about symbiosis and um, horizontal gene, gene transfer. Um, I'd long assumed that you used a technique called agrobacterium mediated transformation to make it. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. The beautiful thing that I'm sure that you've thought about a lot is that the technology that you used is actually a plant technology. So the plant, uh, it, it, well, it's it's a pathogen, agrobacterium, right, is a plant pathogen that inserts its DNA into plants so that it can live from it. And really, you, you went and did that in the other direction. So it's, that was the real beauty for me. And the step above that is that 
this symbiosis symbiosis is at the basis of of life and multicellular life as we uh, as we know it um like just that we swallow uh you know the mitochondria right, and the primary symbiosis question? what my what's primary question? question is is symbiosis central to that work and why didn't you talk about it more if so yeah no i i, I understood the question even before there was a question mark at the end of it <laughs> Uh, so it, it's interesting because uh, agrobacteria, you know, that's nature we're talking about. So in other words, people think of transgenesis as being this lab-driven process, but it occurs naturally in the, in the environment. Transgenesis is part of life. In fact, the Human Genome Project has revealed that we have sequences that come from viruses, from bacteria. In other words, we have always been transgenic. We just simply did not know about it. <laughs> right? So it's, it's really interesting when, when you think about this monstrous entity and then you look at yourself in the mirror and you realize that's yourself. So I think philosophically that's, that's very strong, very significant. We just don't have the time to get into, into it. Uh, yeah, Eduardo's sticking around for a while, so maybe. <laughs> um, thank you. But yeah, symbiosis is part of it, yes, absolutely. Hi, Eduardo. Um, Where are, oh, right, hi. Uh, just curious, regular average person, not scientist. Um, when you started the hologram for Agora, and 37 years ago, you obviously didn't know that it was going to be brought into space. What was your original intent? No, my original intent was for it to be in deep space, and that's oh, why... Oh, always? Okay. Yeah, yeah. I was, in 86, it was a very interesting um, period in my life because I was an artist in residence at the Museum of Holography in New York, where I shot the work. And then I opened my own lab in Rio, and I shot it again in Rio. So I just kept making it in the hopes that I would have more copies and that I could convince people. But it was very difficult. You know, 86, I was 24. So I've been trying to find a way to get access to deep space. To work in space is hard for NASA. It's hard for everybody, <laughs> right? The Russians just tried to land on the moon, and boom, just, just crashed. The Japanese crashed. Israel crashed. It's hard. Space is hard. Hard for everybody. Low Earth orbit is hard. The moon is hard. But deep space is the hardest of all. Right? To place a work in permanent orbit between Earth and Mars is a very difficult thing to do. Right? So the work has been there since 86, but I'm trying to find a way to get to where I intended. And that has taken this long. Not that it has to take that long. But in my case, it has taken this long. Uh, I think the lady at the back was the first. Wait, wait, there's a microphone coming to you. Eduardo, how can you say it's permanent? How do you know it's permanent? It's in orbit. How do you know that something won't interrupt that orbit? I you get know? hit by a meteorite, no? <laughs> well, anything can happen, but the cosmos is so vast. So vast. Just to give you an idea. Not to scare anybody, but the fact is that the Milky Way and Andromeda are in a collision course. In five billion years, everything will disappear anyway, right? But, but scientists estimate that the stars will not collide. Even the galaxies will collide, but they estimate the stars will not because it's so vast. It's not empty space because it's dark matter, etc. but from like a, a general person perspective, there are gaps, gigantic, monumental gaps that are beyond our sense of dimension, right? We're talking about vastness, like immense. So can something hit the rocket? Yeah. But what's the probability? Very, 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 very small it's going to happen. And even if it does, bops around and inserts itself into orbit, right? So last question from the gentleman in the green shirt. Wait, wait, your microphone's coming. Uh, so probably most of us in the audience are lay, uh, maybe speaking out of turn here. But uh, without going down the rabbit hole, can you just explain to us how you actually do gene splicing? How do you take elements from one you know, species and you know, insert it into another? I mean, how does that work? Uh, what te you know, how do you <laughs> you're sitting at a bench. What are you doing? I'm taking the question down the rabbit hole. <laughs> <laughs> That's quite a big question, actually. I, I don't know, know if you. I, I, I don't 
know if you can give a one minute answer, you know. Well, you know, for example, there is a machine that synthesizes DNA. Okay. Right? So you point your sequence and then you get you get your sequence, right? And then you have to amplify it, you have to get more copies of it because it's so small. Like a single DNA is two nanometers wide. I mean, we're talking about very, very small. Just a wavelength of light, light, you know, red light, for example, is 600 nanometers. We're talking about two. I mean, it's very, very small, right? So then you amplify it, and then then you have the stuff, right? And and then you have to splice it into an organism, and then you have to do a little bit of selection to make sure that it's there. That's why I added the, the green sequence. I mean, that's the one minute, but for a longer, you have to take the course. <laughs> All right, thank you everyone for joining us today and wishing you a very lovely visit at Art Basel.